What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about antimycobacterial drugs. Very cool one, very short one. Nice, right? Finally, we're going to have a short video. But when we talk about these particular drugs, it's really important, again, to follow along with me, grab the key, grab the actual illustrations, all the notes that we have at our website. We have a link down in the description, in the description box below. Go check that out so you guys can follow along with me. I really think it'll aid in the learning process. But when we talk about antimycobacterial drugs, there's a lot of different ones that we're gonna talk about here, but we should focus on how do they work? What's their mechanism of action? Because if you're tested on that, you should know what particular site and what kind of like function they interact or inhibit with. And then after that, we'll talk about what are they used for. So we'll talk about obviously TB, MAC infections, the super rare leprosy, but if you get a question on the exam, you'll know it. And then we'll talk about the adverse effects that you gotta watch out for. All right, so first thing, when we talk about this actual mycobacterium, you know, in order for the actual mycobacterium to function, it obviously needs to be able to replicate its DNA and actually also transcribe its DNA, make particular proteins that allows for it to be able to control its structural and functional proteins. We need that to occur. Well, we have particular drugs that can inhibit this cute little pink enzyme. You know what this cute little pink enzyme is called? This enzyme here is called RNA polymerase. And what RNA polymerase does is, is it takes DNA, reads it, and from reading it, it makes a molecule called RNA. Particularly, this would be mRNA. Now, because it stimulates this particular step, mRNA then does what? It actually interacts with ribosomes, and those ribosomes will then synthesize particular types of proteins. And these proteins can obviously be structural, uh, proteins they can be functional proteins, but either way, these bad boys are proteins and they're essential to the actual bacterial's function. Well, if I give this particular drug called rifamycin, you know there's actually two particular ones that I want you to remember that treat mycobacterial infections. One is called rifampin. This is gonna be the very, common, very commonly utilized one. And the other one is called rifabutin. And rifabutin is actually an interesting one. Uh, we utilize a little bit more commonly in MAC infections, uh, but particularly if someone has HIV positive, rifampin causes a lot of interactions with the CYP450 system. So rifabutin's a little bit more preferred. But Either way, these drugs are going to inhibit the RNA polymerase. If you inhibit the RNA polymerase, can they take DNA and convert it into mRNA? No. So this type of reaction here will occur. There's less mRNA that's being formed. That means that less proteins will be formed. Proteins are a, a, integral to the actual structure and function of mycobacterium. You lose that, you lose their ability to be able to survive. They will then die. So that's a really cool function of this particular drug. Now, in the same way, focusing at the nucleic acid level, you know, nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides and from nucleotides we use very specific molecules that we can add into them, uh, that we can use to make nucleotides to incorporate into the DNA or incorporate into RNA. There's this molecule here called paraminobenzoic acid, and paraminobenzoic acid is actually converted to something called uh, dihydrofolate and then tetrahydrofolate, and that's usually in, uh, incorporated into particular types of like thymine nucleotides. So it's important to incorporate into DNA and into RNA, particularly as a nucleotide like thymine. Now, if I give a particular drug, right, Dapsone, what Dapsone will do is, Dapsone will actually inhibit the particular enzymes involved in converting paraminobenzoic acid into dihydrofolate. So it's involved in the metabolic pathway here, so it'll inhibit this particular step. When it inhibits the conversion of paraminobenzoic acid into dihydrofolate, that means you get less of this, less of this, and less incorporation into DNA and RNA, less of the actual nucleotides to make DNA to make RNA. And that is important because if we don't have that, we can't actually have the nucleic acids that we need to code for replication and transcription processes. Pretty straightforward. All right, so we got rifamycins, which is inhibiting the RNA polymerases, dapsone, which is inhibiting the metabolic pathway that makes nucleotides via the paraminobenzoic acid pathway. The next one that I want you guys to remember is streptomycin. Now, streptomycin is actually pretty cool. Streptomycin is a kind of a second line agent that you can use in like TB infections. But what streptomycin will do is it inhibits a very specific component here. So you know how we need mRNA to in, uh, interact with the ribosome. Specifically, there's the two components, the 30S and the 50S ribosomal subunit. Streptomycin will bind to the 30S ribosomal subunit and inhibit it from being able to interact with the RNA and make proteins. So if you inhibit the 30S ribosomal subunit, what do you do to the actual protein synthesis? You decrease protein synthesis. So again, I want you to remember streptomycin inhibits the 30S ribosomal subunit, uh, rifamycin inhibits the RNA polymerase enzyme, and dapsone inhibits the paraminobenzoic acid pathway, leading to less tetrahydrofolate, less nucleotides that are needed in DNA and RNA. All right. The next thing here is isoniazid. Now this one is a little bit kind of a complicated pathway. I'm going to try to dumb it down a little bit, but 
what happens is isoniazid gets taken up into this actual mycobacterial cell. When it gets taken up into the mycobacterial cell, it's converted into like a metabolite, kind of an active metabolite. We're just gonna kind of draw like little asterisks on this because now it's activated. In order for it to be activated, there's a very specific enzyme that performs that function to activate it once it's brought into the mycobacterium. And this is called catalase peroxidase, also known as CAT-G enzyme. And what this does is it activates the isoniazid into this active metabolite, all right? Once it's in this active metabolite form, it then binds with another molecule that's present inside of the actual mycobacterium. And this molecule is called NAD. So it'll bind with NAD. So then we get kind of this active metabolite of isoniazid, plus we have bound to it the NAD molecule. Once you have this, this molecule is very interesting because of what it can do is, it finds a little enzyme here. You see this, this enzyme right here? This enzyme is called enoyl reductase. And what enoyl reductase does is, is it helps to be able to stimulate the production of particular molecules that are integral into the cell wall. And obviously the cell wall is important for resisting osmotic forces. If you don't have the integral component of it, you aren't able to resist osmotic forces and the actual bacterial cell will die. What is that particular component that it makes? Well, let's actually say that we take a slice of the cell wall out and zoom in on it. There's different types of molecules that are integral to the actual cell wall. And this would be from the outer portion all the way to the inner portion. So outer to inner. That inner uh, layer here is gonna be the inner cell membrane. So this would be your cell membrane as the innermost layer. So your phospholipid bilayer. Then after that, in this pink layer, this is your peptidoglycan layer. So this is your peptidoglycan layer. Then after that, in this maroon color here, we have something called arabinogalactin. Arabinogalactin. So kind of like a sugar molecule, kind of like a polysaccharide molecule. Then you have this fatty acid layer called mycolic acid. So mycolic acid, very important component. And on the outermost layer here in red, you have your glycolipid layer. Now, What's really, really important is enol reductase helps to be able to synthesize the mycolic acid molecules, which are integral to the cell wall. Whenever you give them isoniazid, it gets converted into this metabolite, binds with NAD, and now when it binds with NAD and it's in the activated form, it can then inhibit the enol reductase. If we inhibit the enol reductase, we then reduce the synthesis of mycolic acid. If we reduce the synthesis of mycolic acid, we lose an integral component of the cell wall and the bacteria and then subsequently die. So that's isoniazid. I know it's a little bit complicated, but I hope that pathway makes it a little bit more uh, simplified. All right, to go along with mycolic acid, there's another particular drug. We didn't completely know how this enzyme, or this drug actually worked. It's still questionable, but what we know is that this drug here called pyrazinamide works to inhibit mycolic acid formation. And so there was questions of how exactly it does it. Some of the most recent literature says that it inhibits a very specific enzyme. And this enzyme is called fatty acid synthase. And mycolic acid is kind of like a fatty acid. So if you don't have this enzyme, guess what this enzyme actually does? It helps to be able to synthesize the very important molecule that we incorporate into the cell wall. What do you think it is? Mycolic acid. So if we inhibit this enzyme, we use pyrazinamide, we inhibit the actual fatty acid synthase, can we make the mycolic acid molecules that are integral to the actual cell wall? No. So we'll decrease the actual synthesis of mycolic acid molecules. So two drugs will inhibit mycolic acid. One is isoniazid, through this kind of complex pathway, and the other one is pyrazinamide, which inhibits the fatty acid synthase. So fatty acid synthase, pyrazinamide, enol reductase inhibition, isoniazid. Okay, we're almost done. Last one here. Ethambutol is another interesting one. So remember I told you that there was two important components here to the actual cell wall. Mycolic acid is a big one that I want you to remember. And then this maroon color one here is the arabinoglactin. This is another important layer that I want you to remember. This enzyme here is called arabinosoil transferase. You're like, what the heck? This enzyme here is called arabinosoil transferase. And what this enzyme does is, is it takes particular like sugar molecules that are present inside of the bacteria. The two sugar molecules that you actually would need to remember, one is called arabinose, and the other one is called galactose. What it'll do is it'll take a combination of these molecules, utilize them, and then convert them into arabinogalactin, 
okay, which is integral into making this particular molecule here that it's incorporated into the cell wall. So it'll use these molecules and make this thing called arabinoglactin. That's what the job of this enzyme is. If I give this drug called ethambutol, ethambutol will inhibit the arabinosyl transferase. If I inhibit arabinosyl transferase, I can't take arabinose and galactose and make arabinoglactin. If I can't make arabinoglactin, do I have the integrity of the actual cell wall? No, I lose my integrity, therefore the actual bacterial cell is susceptible to death. So, to quickly recap these, rifamycin inhibits RNA polymerases, streptomycin inhibits the 30S ribosomal subunit, dapsone inhibits the PABA pathway, which inhibits nucleotide formation, isoniazid inhibits fatty acid synthesis, particularly of mycolic acid by inhibiting enoyl reductase, Pyrazinamide inhibits mycolic acid formation by inhibiting fatty acid synthase. And ethambutol inhibits arabinoglactin formation by inhibiting arabinosyl transferase. I know it was a lot, slightly complicated. I apologize, but I hope this makes sense. Now let's move on to the actual indications of these drugs. We're gonna talk about what are the actual clinical usages. It's actually straightforward, so mycobacterium tuberculosis. We're not gonna go through the entire pathophys and all the clinical features of TB. We'll talk about that when we dedicate an actual lecture to tuberculosis and all these other ones. But when we talk about tuberculosis, obviously we know it's due to the bacterium mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now obviously that, that area, love, that bacterium loves the lung, so it loves to kind of stay, interact with macrophages and cause these types of nasty lesions as you can see within the lungs. And then the problem is once it actually causes these lesions typically within the upper lobes of the lungs, what happens is it has the ability of, so actually if someone's like severely immunosuppressed for some reason, it can disseminate and spread to other organs of the body, where it can spread to the actual brain, causing like meningitis or encephalitis, spread to the actual bones, where it can cause osteomyelitis, spread to the adrenals, where it can cause adrenal failure, spread to the liver, cause liver failure, spread to the actual lymph nodes, causing like lymphadenopathy or scrofula. So a lot of things that can happen when you have this infection. But the question is, sometimes people can be infected with TB, never know it, not have any idea, but when we do like the tuberculosis uh, skin test, the PPD test, and we see that the bump is maybe a particular size, but they don't have any active infection going on, but they have maybe the latent infection of TB, we can treat them for that. Now, if they have the full-blown active infection where it's involving the lungs or it's disseminating, then we have an active TB treatment. We should know what are the agents that we utilize in the latent, and what are the ones that we utilize in the active infection. So in the latent TB, where they're not actually having active pneumonia infection, they're not disseminating into the actual uh, systemic vasculature and other parts of the body, we utilize two particular drugs that we can uh, use here, one or the other. So one is you can use isoniazid, commonly abbreviated INH, just get used to that one, I might use that sometimes. So INH, we can do this for about six to nine months. Some literature will say six months, some will say nine months. It depends upon how frequently you take it. The other one we can utilize is rifampin. So rifampin, would be the other option that we could utilize here, and we could use that one for four months. So if a patient has latent TB, they test positive, or they have a particular size of their tuberculin skin test, we can put them on one of these two drugs for that time duration. Now, if they have active TB, they actually have active, like, caseating granulomas with inside of the lungs, or they have gone complexes, or they have ranky complexes, or they have dissemination to other areas of the body, they have active TB, we treat them a little bit differently. We utilize, what's called a ripe regimen. <laughs> that sounds crazy, but you start off first um, with what's called the ripe regimen. So this is rifampin, isoniazid, pyrocinamide, and ethambutol. So you utilize these four drugs first for at least two months, okay? After the two months are up, you then move into the second part of the regimen, which you utilize rifampin and isoniazid for four months. So it always works in this particular fashion. For the first two months, you use the ripe drugs, rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. For the second part of the regimen, for the next four months, you use rifampin and isoniazid. When you have a patient on isoniazid, one of the common adverse effects is B6 deficiency, which can cause neuropathy, it can cause anemia, it can even increase the risk of seizures. So because of that, we want to be able to give the patient B6. So we give them B6 supplements to be able to augment that and prevent them from developing B6 deficiency because of isoniazid. Now, if a patient has active tuberculosis and it's actually seeding, it's spreading, so they have like miliary TB or they have TB meningitis, oftentimes we may add on streptomycin as a second line agent. But generally when you're at this point, you're gonna seek the ID consult 
because they're gonna be way too sick for you to be able to have to figure this out. You'll seek out an actual infectious disease specialist and they'll be able to kind of figure out what is best in this situ situation. So what I think is the most important to remember is what are the two uh, drugs that we can utilize in latent TB? What are the length of their duration? Then active TB, what are the actual regimen? RIPE and then rifampin and INH. Two months for the RIPE, four months for the rifampin and INH. Add B6, it's very important. Sometimes you can add streptomycin or other particular drugs into this regimen if they have more systemic or refractory TB. All right, so the next one here is Mycobacterium leprae, so leprosy. So in this one, I can't say that you'll often see this very often, but in, it's a mycobacterium, so we should know the particular agents that we utilize for this in the same way that we know tuberculosis. So typically it loves to involve the skin, so it likes to cause like these hypopigmented skin lesions. That's one particular thing. So you may see particular skin lesions, and then the other thing is you actually may see nerve palsies. Um, so it typically likes to cause like thickening of the nerves. And when it thickens up the nerves, it actually may get compression in particular areas. One of the common areas is like the ulnar nerve. So you may see like an ulnar nerve palsy. That might be one. Um, and then the other one is the peroneal nerve. So you actually may see a peroneal nerve palsy in these wells. Uh, situations as well. So that would be the particular thing to think about. Now, if somebody does have leprosy, what are the particular agents that we utilize in this? It's often two particular drugs, dapsone and rifampin. So I want you guys to remember dapsone and rifampin. Sometimes we may add another drug in called uh, clofazamine, uh, but generally that's if they have like what's called the uh, tuberculoid form of leprosy. So I don't want to go too far down that road. Remember dapsone, rifampin for lepre. Remember these isonized it for six to nine months for latent TB, rifampin for four months for latent TB, active is ripe for two months, rifampin high in H for four months, and then add on your B6. The last mycobacterium infection that I want to talk about is called a MAC. Uh, so it's called Mycobacterium avium intracellular complex infections. Let's talk about that. So with Mycobacterium avium intracellular complex infections, generally these love to cause like these like fibrocavitary like pneumonia. So we're obviously going to see like some type of pneumonia, like generally some type of like nodular fibrocavitary lesion. What can happen is in certain situations, this can actually disseminate, especially in immunosuppressed individuals, spread to the liver, spread to the actual bone marrow, and even spread to the spleen. In situations where a patient tests positive for mycobacterium avium intracellular complex, what do you treat them with? It's usually uh, particularly like a three-part combination. So what you're gonna utilize one drug is called ethambutol. You guys remember that one? And then we'll add on another drug to that and we usually utilize what's called rifampin. So we'll add rifampin as another one that we can utilize. And then the last one here is we add something called a macrolide. We talked about this in the antibiotic section, but this would be particularly like your clarithromycin, your azithromycin. The next thing to potentially consider is the plus or minuses. When will we add other particular agents on? So these are the primary agents that we're gonna utilize in the MAC infection. But we may add on things like aminoglycosides. You may add on things like fluoroquinolones, particularly in those severe or refractory cases severe slash refractory cases. But that would be the particular thing that I would want you guys to remember for the mycobacterium avium intracellular complex infections. You always start with ethambutol, rifampin, and a macrolide, plus or minus an aminoglycoside or fluoroquinolone in the severe refractory cases. One thing to add to these actual things here is that anytime you're actually giving somebody rifampin, so I would add this as an extra little side note in case they ask you this on the exam. If a patient is HIV positive and they are going to be on rifampin, if you put them on rifampin, whether that be for mycobacterium leprae, whether that be for tuberculosis, or whether that be for mycobacterium avium intracellular complex, because rifampin can interact with the CYP450 system, you might want to switch to rifabutin. So this may be a question that they ask on the exam because there is less interaction with the NRTIs, and that is extremely important. Because remember when we treat HIV, we use NRTIs or NNRTIs or protease inhibitors, all those different drugs. Well, if you give someone rifampin, rifampin may actually decrease the concentration of these NRTIs, NNRTIs, but if you give them rifabutin, there is no actual cytochrome P450 inhibition with this one. So less effect on the NRTIs, NNRTIs, protease inhibitors, all those things. So that's really, really important to remember. So HIV positive patient that you're putting on rifampin, switch them to rifabutin because there's less kind of like drug interactions there. 
All right, now that we talked about that, let's hit the adverse reactions. All right, so let's talk about the adverse effects of these antimicrobacterial drugs. So first thing, rifampin. What do we need to know about this one? First thing is that they will ask you this on the exam. Patient comes in, they're freaking out because they have red orange urine. That's a completely normal, harmless adverse effect of rifampin, but just be aware, it is an adverse effect. And I would probably let the patient know that before they go you know, home, <laughs> okay? So watch out for any kind of like red, orange urine. It's completely harmless but just let them know that so that they don't have like a heart attack, okay? Then the other thing here is that it can actually cause false positive urine opiate tests. I just thought that was an interesting thing to potentially know. So false positive urine opiates. But I think the other big thing to remember here is the effect on the CYP450 system. Remember I told you it acts as an inducer. So because of that, if you give this, it's going to decrease the concentration of a particular drug that you're taking it with. That's why if a patient is HIV positive and they're taking NRTIs or NNRTIs or protease inhibitors, if you give that with rifampin, it can actually decrease the concentration of that drug because it is a CYP450 450 inducer. So it's important to be able to remember that when you put them on rifampin. Watch out for any other drugs that they're taking it with. All right, pyrazinamide. What's the important thing to remember for this one? Monitor those LFTs. Some people will say rifampin is hepatotoxic. It is a very minor, minor, minor hepatotoxicity. It's important to train the LFTs, but it's significantly less hepatotoxic in comparison to all these other ones. So pyrazinamide is the big one that I would remember is hepatotoxic. This one in isoniazid. So hepatotoxicity, watch for the bump in the LFTs. So watch for any kinds of hepatotoxicity. Next thing here, with pyrazinamide, it plays a particular role within the uric acid. So it may actually reduce the uric acid in the actual urine and increase the uric acid inside of the blood. And so this is called hyper uricemia. So it may increase the uric acid in the blood, causing hyperuricemia. So if the patient is actually in the vignette and they say, okay, putting them on pyrazinamide, but they have a history of gout, what should you potentially watch out for? Worse exacerbations of their gout because you're going to increase their uric acid levels, increase uric acid crystal formation, and it can deposit into that big toe and then they come in, ah, my toe's all jacked up. So important to remember that with the pyrazinamide. Ethambutol, what is the important thing to remember for this one? It affects the eye, particularly the optic nerve. So this can actually cause optic neuritis. Important to remember that they may have visual disturbances and decreased visual acuity. So optic neuritis. So whenever you put this medication on somebody, watch out for any types of visual dysfunction, maybe follow up with the optometrist or ophthalmologist. All right, so rifampin, red, orange urine, false positive urine screens. This is the big one, CYP450 inducer. Pyrazinamide, hepatotoxic, hyperuricemia, watch out in gout. Ethambutol, optic neuritis, consider doing like follow up with the actual ophthalmologist or particularly optometry. Dapsone, if you put somebody on Dapsone, what should you potentially watch out for? One of the big things is it can actually oxidize the hemoglobin and convert it into the ferric form. Whenever that does that, you can't bind oxygen. So oxygen won't be able to bind with this ferric form, this oxidized form. And because of that, they can cause hypoxia, more of like a cytotoxic or histotoxic hypoxia. And this is actually called met hemoglobinemia. So watch out for this one. The other thing is, if a patient has a G6 PDH deficiency and you give them Dapsone, it can increase their hemolytic events. And so it may cause an acute hemolysis event. And that's an important thing to remember, along with like nitrofrantoin and fluoroquinolones and, and Bactrim and things like that. The other thing is it can actually suppress the production of particular white blood cells, such as neutrophils. So it may actually cause a neutropenia. All right, so big thing to watch out for, again, methemoglobinemia, G6PDH deficiency, if they have that and you give them this drug, it can cause an acute hemolytic crisis and neutropenia. Ethambutol, uh, optic neuritis, pyrazinamide, hyperuricemia, hepatotoxicity, rifampin, watch out for the CYP450 induction. All right, let's come down isoniazid and streptomycin. All right, isoniazid, what do we gotta remember about this bad boy? This one actually will cause some injury to the liver. So watch out for the bump in the LFTs. You should monitor that when you have the patient on isoniazid or what else? Pyrazinamide. Not so much with the rifampin, though. Remember that. The other thing, here's what's really interesting. It can actually cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis through two ways. So it can cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis by bumping your beta hydroxybutyrate. Do you remember what that is? That's a ketone body. So it may cause a ketoacidosis because of it causing an increased acetyl CoA metabolism or increase through the acetyl CoA pathway. And it also can increase your lactate. So it may cause a lactic acidosis and a Ketoacidosis is a particular cause of their anion gap metabolic acidosis. 
The other thing is it can cause a drug-induced lupus. You're like, what the heck? It's important to actually remember this because especially in your exams, uh, especially in the um, uh, step one, they may ask you what are the particular drugs to remember that can cause drug-induced lupus. And this is one of them, isoniza, but you can remember this by the SHIP mnemonic. Sulfa drugs, hydralazine, isoniazid, procainamide, and phenytoin. Just remember these because they can come up on your exam. The next thing is it can cause a B6 deficiency. Now B6 deficiency can do two things. One of the things with the B6 deficiency is it may alter the myelination of particular neurons and lead to neuropathy. So watch out for any types of peripheral neuropathy. The other thing is it can also alter the activity of particular uh, enzymes inside of the actual red blood cell or alter the ability to make red blood cells. And this can lead to anemia, whether this is like a uh, aplastic anemia or a sideroblastic anemia, it can drop your red blood cells. The other thing is it can actually cause seizures. So it may actually reduce your seizure threshold. And these can actually be refractory. So you can actually give a patient like multiple benzos if they're in status epilepticus and it'll not work. So watch out for any refractory to benzos um, in patients who have a B6 deficiency. You give them some B6, they actually might start responding to some of the benzos, okay? So isoniazid, it, watch for hepatotoxicity, watch the anion gap for any metabolic acidosis, watch for drug-induced lupus, remember the mnemonic, and then seizures, refractory to benzos, and then with B6 deficiency, you can particularly see anemia and neuropathy. Last one here is your streptomycin. Remember, that's that second line in your mycobacterium tuberculosis. We don't, it's not a part of the RIPE regimen. It's not a part of the second part for the four months afterwards. It's more of the add-on for like miliary TB or more of your TB meningitis. And these ones, it's important to remember, it's an aminoglycoside. Aminoglycosides are nephrotoxic. They will jack those kidneys up. So watch for any signs of nephrotoxicity. So monitor their creatinine, monitor their BUN, their urine output. The other thing is it can actually really hurt their inner ear, causing ototoxicity. Particularly, it can actually hit the uh, eighth cranial nerve, right? So particularly watch out for the vestibular cochlear nerve. So watch out for any ototoxicity. And it also can affect the growth of the baby. So it's important to remember that it's teratogenic. Teratogenic is a big one here. So avoid this in patients who are pregnant. And then the last thing is you want to be careful if you give this to a patient who has a history of myasthenia gravis. It should be contraindicated in what's called myasthenia gravis. I'm going to put MG. The reason why is it alters with the actual uh, re response of the antibodies that actually bind at the, particularly at the nicotinic receptor on the muscle cells. And so this may alter that in a particular way. So it's important to remember, do not give this in patients who have myasthenia gravis, do not give this in patients who are pregnant and watch the actual renal function. And again, watch for any kind of changes in their hearing when you put a patient on streptomycin. All right, my friends, you think we're done, but we gotta review this. We gotta, we gotta anchor this stuff into our cerebral cortex. So let's do some cases and see if we can actually anchor this stuff into our cerebral Bro. All right, Nation, so let's do some practice problems or kind of like really understand what we talked about here on the whiteboard. So you're performing rounds, you're with your infectious disease attending, and they say, okay, I'm going to ask you some questions about their mechanism of action. Let's see if you guys can pick out which drug it is based upon what I'm kind of prefacing you with. So first one is, which drug inhibits the RNA polymerase? So this cute little enzyme here that takes DNA, makes RNA, and helps to be able to synthesize particular types of bacterial proteins. This would be your rifamycins, right? So your rifampin, rifabutin, things of that nature. Next one is which one of the drugs actually inhibits the 30S ribosomal subunit inhibiting protein synthesis that are needed in the bacteria? This would be streptomycin, great. Which one of these drugs actually works to inhibit the arabinosyl transferase, which takes arabinose and galactose and makes arabinol, arabinoglactin, which is an important component of the actual cell wall? You guys know? This would be which particular structures? Come on, let's see if you guys remember this one. Come on. This is the ethambutol, so ethambutol. Which drugs actually inhibit the fatty acid synthase that takes particular like fatty acids and helps to be able to make what's called mycolic acid, which is an important component of the actual cell wall? This would be pyrazinamide. Which of the particular drugs helps to be able to inhibit the enzyme that actually helps to convert what's called the uh, paraminobenzoic acid into dihydrofolate and then subsequently tetrahydrofolate, which is needed to be able to make nucleotides to incorporate into the DNA? This would be, which particular drug do you guys remember? 
Dapsone, right, okay, good. Next one is which one of the drugs is actually gonna be taken into the fungal cell, acted on by the catalase, catalase peroxidase, and whenever that happens, it turns it into an inactive, I mean, it turns it from an inactive into a very active type of molecule. There it binds with NAD, and when it binds with NAD, this molecule here can actually can inhibit enoyl reductase, and what that does is it decreases the synthesis of mycolic acid in the cell wall. This is going to be isoniazid. All right, great. So we covered all of these particular drugs, okay? Next question is, is a patient has latent tuberculosis. What are the particular treatment options for those with latent TB? You guys remember that we always can consider two options. One is we can do isoniazid for about six to nine months, right? Or rifampin for about four months. The next question is you have a patient with active tuberculosis. If they have active tuberculosis, you always do the RIPE regimen. So rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol for two months. Then you subsequently follow after that with rifampin and isoniazid for four months and add on B6 because B6 is important because if you're taking isoniazid, that can actually cause a B6 deficiency and lead to neuropathy and seizures, et cetera. So it's important to remember that. The other thing is if a patient is HIV positive and also has an active TB or a latent TB, you should consider switching rifampin to rifabutin. And the reason why is rifampin can actually act at that cytochrome P450 system. And when you give rifabutin, it doesn't actually act to have as much interaction with the CYP450 system because what can happen is, is uh, rifampin is a CYP450 uh, uh, what's called inducer. And because it's actually acting as an inducer, it decreases the concentration of the particular drug that's being metabolized by the CYP450 system. And that in patients who are taking HIV medications like NRTIs, it would decrease the efficacy of those drugs or the concentration of those drugs. So that's why you switch to rifabutin because it's not an inducer. And if they have TB meningitis or miliary meningitis, you should really seek infectious disease expertise, um, but you can consider adding on streptomycin. All right, another patient has what's called the MAC infection, so Mycobacterium avium intracellular infection. What are the particular treatment options? Because this is another type of mycobacteria. So we can actually consider treating these patients with what? We can do rifampin, or also known as rifabutin if they have HIV. We can also consider ethambutol, and then lastly, we can add on a macrolide like azithromycin, okay? Now, if they have severe refractory cases, you can add on something like a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside. So again, ethambutol, rifampin, and a macrolide for a MAC infection. And the big ones to remember here is that ethambutol is a part of that, that tri triad and rifampin is a part of that. So again, for latent TB, Isoniazid six to nine months or rifampin for four months. If it's active, it's gonna be the ripe for two months and then after rifampin, isoniazid for four months. Add B6, can switch to rifabutin if they have HIV, okay? Add streptomycin refractory um, or miliary types of TB or uh, what's called uh, menin uh, tuberculosis meningitis. If it's a MAC, ethambutol, rifampin, and macrolide. Add on aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones in refractory cases. All right, you have another person who has another bite in mycobacterial infection called mycobacterium leprae, which is leprosy. If they have leprosy, this obviously causes these hypopigmented and nasty skin lesions, and this can also lead to nerve palsies. It thickens the nerve, which can actually cause compression of the ulnar nerve, the peroneal nerve, and this can cause a lot of problems there as well. So we treat these patients with dapsone and rifampin. Dapsone and rifampin, you can add on clofazamine and tuberculoid leprosy. So rifampin, dapsone, mycobacterium leprae, ethambutol, rifampin, macrolide, and mycobacterium avium intracellular. Rifampin for four months, isoniazid for six to nine months, and latent, ripe for two, rifampin, isoniazid for four, if it's active TB. Switch rifampin to rifabutin if any patient has HIV because it can reduce the efficacy of the NRTIs. All right, boom. Now the next thing that we have to think about is what are the adverse drug reactions? So. A big thing to think about here is we talked about all of these already and what they're treating. But let's start off with the rifamycins first. What I want you guys to remember, especially with rifampin, it causes red orange urine. And this is actually completely harmless. It's just something to think about if a patient starts kind of getting really scared. The other thing is it can actually cause a false positive urine opiate. So if someone's actually getting drug screened, remember it can potentially cause a false positive. The other thing is what's called rifampin. It's a CYP450 inducer, meaning that it can actually uh, work to actually increase the activity of the cytochrome P450 metabolism, which will decrease the concentration of the drug. All right, so those are big things to remember. The next one that we should talk about here is 
going to be isoniazid. This is the big one. It's really, it actually hepatotoxic. So you should be monitoring patients' LFTs. And it can also produce what's called a metabolic acidosis. It can actually increase the production of ketone bodies and it can actually increase the production of lactate. So watch out for any metabolic acidoses that have an anion gap that's elevated. The other thing is it can actually suppress the bone marrow and potentially lead to anemia. One of the ways that we think this is actually maybe sideroblastic anemia by, due to the B6 deficiency. And then the other thing is it can actually cause drug-induced lupus. Remember the mnemonic SHIP, right? So we said sulfa drugs, hydralazine, isoniazid, um, and then we also have phenytoin um, and procainamide. And then remember it can also cause seizures. It can lower the seizure threshold whenever patients have B6 deficiency, having them become refractory to benzodiazepines, and it can also cause neuropathy. All right, pyrazinamide, we said that this is also hepatotoxic, so watch those LFTs, and it can also increase the uric acid, so watch out for this in patients who have gout. Ethambutol can cause optic neuritis, so it can cause changes in their vision, so make sure that they're getting annual eye exams if they're on this drug. And then we have a patient who's on Dapsone for, again, what was that for? Leprosy. We can actually watch out for any met hemoglobinemia, uh, G6PDH deficiency that can actually, if they take it, uh, this and they have that underlying disease, it can actually cause an acute hemolytic crisis, what will cause a severe anemia. And then watch out for neutropenia, okay? And then we also have streptomycin, which any aminoglycoside within this category is nephrotoxic, ototoxic, teratogenic as well. And then again, can be contraindicated in myasthenia gravis because it can worsen the myasthenia gravis. All right, engineers, that covers the antimicrobials. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. As always, until next time.